Supersonic air travel remains a dream for many around the world. That dream was realized in the past, but it ultimately could fly no longer. This was during a time in which computers were yet to become commonplace in homes. Let's revisit this monument and see why it was just so badass. Maybe even too badass to exist. The beginning. The Concorde project began in the early 1950s when Arnold Hall, head of the Royal Aircraft Establishment, RAE, urged Morrie and Morgan to organize a group to investigate the concept of supersonic transport, SST. The committee met for the first time in February 1954 and their first report was issued in April 1955. Around this time, even the fastest jet fighters in serial military use had just begun reaching supersonic speeds. From the get-go, it was an extremely ambitious project. It was recognized at the time that drags at supersonic speeds was significantly proportional to wingspan. This resulted in the adoption of short-span, narrow, trapezoidal wings, such as those seen on the control surfaces of many missiles or in aircraft evaluated by the team, such as the Lockheed F-104 Starfighter or the Avro 730. Based on this concept, the Ministry of Supply instructed Mori and Morgan to organize a new study group, the Supersonic Transport Aircraft Committee, or STAC, on October 1st, 1956, with the specific purpose of producing a workable design and finding industrial partners to build it. Hawker Siddeley and Bristol were eventually awarded contracts in 1959 for preliminary designs, which evolved into the SHA-1000 and Bristol-198. Even at this early stage, the Stack Group, which included Hawker and Bristol, as well as the government, were looking for partners to help improve the ideas. This is because the costs were found to be too prohibitive. Hawker approached Lockheed in September 1959, and with the formation of the British Aircraft Corporation in 1960, the old Bristol team quickly began discussions with Boeing, General Dynamics, Douglas Aircraft and Sud Aviation, a French government-owned aerospace corporation. NASA was brought over too, and they performed their own testing of the wing design. NASA privately supported the crew by temporarily modifying a Douglas F-5D Skylancer with temporary wing alterations to simulate the wing choices. The wing was successfully tested by NASA test aircraft in 1965, and it was discovered that it lowered landing speed substantially more than the ordinary Delta wing. In the meantime, the French designed their own version of the concept, the French government sent Pierre Satre, a government-owned aviation company's technical director, to Bristol to seek cooperation as soon as the design was completed in April 1960. Bristol was shocked to learn that the Sud team had designed a similar aircraft after considering the SST problem and reaching the same economic conclusions as the Bristol and Stack teams. The initial stack report, labelled for UK eyes only, was later proven to have been secretly provided to the French to gain political favour. Sud made small adjustments to the paper before presenting it as their own. Unsurprisingly, the two teams discovered a lot of common ground, and Bristol had no idea at the time that the plans had been essentially given up. It was up to the two governments to put in the final signature. After much debate, with the British finding it difficult to work with the French President Charles de Gaulle, the decision to proceed was eventually based on an unusual political expedient. The UK was campaigning for admittance to the European Economic Community at the time, and this became the primary reason for forging forward with the aircraft. The development project was structured as an international treaty between the two countries rather than a commercial deal between corporations, and it featured a clause imposing high penalties for cancellation, which was originally requested by the UK government. On November 29, 1962, this treaty was signed. The name Concorde was chosen to symbolise the collaborative efforts of the British and French to design and build the aircraft. Performance and Luxury The Concorde was outfitted with four Rolls-Royce afterburner engines, similar to those found on fighter jets, each producing 38,000 pounds of pressure. The aircraft had a slanted droop nose that dropped during takeoff and landing, allowing pilots to see the runway. The plane's revised brake systems allowed it to land safely on the tarmac while landing at much faster speeds than its subsonic contemporaries. 
Because the plane's nose temperature could reach 278 degrees Fahrenheit when in flight, it was painted in a highly reflective white paint that radiated heat. The plane's triangular delta wings, which allowed it to handle varied angles of attack while soaring at rapid speeds, were perhaps the most stunning engineering innovations. None of these lesser technical improvements approached the revolutionary status of the thin delta wing design that made the sustained supersonic flight possible, said Sammy Chittam, author of The Last Days of Concord. That sense of accomplishment and hard effort paid off. The Concorde flew for the first time four months before men stepped on the moon. Being supersonic, it was fast, really fast. The Concorde could fly through the sky at speeds of up to Mach 2, which is about 1,350 miles per hour. Despite the earth-shattering sound-only explosion that echoed as the plane broke through the sound barrier, everything within the cabin seemed tranquil and comfortable, even as the plane seemed to defy physical logic. The Concorde engines guzzled 6,770 gallons of gasoline every hour, forcing ticket prices into the quadruple digits in 1970s money. Of course, to justify the price, the service was excellent and the surroundings were luxurious. Passengers could expect to drink champagne and dine on caviar in luxury at high altitudes. Even though the Concorde cabins were thin and bare bones with a six-foot-tall ceiling, few could complain about the experience. Because of the premium fares charged for Concorde flights, the aircraft drew a clientele of largely senior business executives who didn't require entertainment. Of course, the propaganda and alliance-building value of the Concorde were not ignored. Many times, the leaders of France and the United Kingdom flew in Concorde. During foreign travels, Presidents Georges Pompidou, Valérie Giscard d'Estaing and François Mitterrand all utilised Concorde as the French flagship aircraft. Queen Elizabeth II and Prime Ministers Edward Heath, Jim Callaghan, Margaret Thatcher, John Major and Tony Blair flew Concorde on charter flights to Barbados for her Silver Jubilee in 1977, to the Middle East in 1984 and to the United States in 1991. In May 1989, Pope John Paul II also flew on Concorde, making him the only top religious figure in the world to ever fly supersonic. The Americans who were involved through NASA also tried their hand. The Boeing 2707 and the Lockheed L2000 were the American designs for the SST project. These were supposed to be bigger, with seating for up to 300 people. Running several years behind Concorde, the Boeing 2707 was reconfigured to a cropped Delta layout. The additional cost of these revisions contributed to the project's demise. The operation of US military aircraft such as the Mach 3 Plus, North American XB-70 Valkyr prototypes and Convair B-58 Hustler strategic nuclear bomber had demonstrated that sonic booms could reach the ground and the experience from the Oklahoma City sonic boom tests led to the same environmental issues that hampered Concorde's commercial success. The scale of the technological leap prompted the USSR to attempt to make its own supersonic passenger jet. They showed the 2144, dubbed Konkordsky by Western European press due to its exterior resemblance to the Concorde. It was claimed that Soviet espionage activities led to the theft of Concorde designs, ostensibly to aid in the design of the 2144. The initial 2144 prototype was significantly different from the pre-production machines because of a rushed development program, but both were cruder than Concorde. Later versions were improved, but it was still a one-of-a-kind communist rendition of a supersonic airplane, thus it didn't appeal to luxury. However, it was plagued by many of the same issues that plagued the original. Issues While 16 airlines initially ordered the Concorde, the plane debuted during the 1973 oil crisis, which reduced demand for a thirsty supersonic plane. Only 20 Concordes were produced in total, with six remaining as prototypes. Any airplane could be outrun by the Concorde. It could never endure the economic and engineering difficulties that were constantly on the horizon. For one thing, the cost of burning fuel at such an unparalleled rate meant that even the plane's well-heeled clientele struggled to afford the ticket fees. It frequently flew with vacant seats. 
The disaster of the competing Tupolev Tu-144 at the paris Le Bourget air show had startled potential purchasers, and public worry about the environmental challenges presented by a supersonic aircraft, the sonic boom, takeoff noise and pollution had caused a shift in public opinion of supersonic jets. Because of the cacophonous sonic boom, some countries prohibited the plane from flying over their airspace, limiting routes to those over the ocean. For fear of noise pollution and windows shattering below, the United States still has rules in place that prohibit supersonic jets from flying across the country. The anti-Concorde project went into action nearly as soon as the Concorde was ready to take to the runway, confirming academic studies that identified the plane's negative environmental impact. After persevering for 30 years, the catastrophic crash occurred. Air France Flight 4590 crashed during takeoff in July 2000 as a result of a ruptured tyre that blasted debris into a fuel tank. A cataclysmic fire killed all 109 individuals on board, damaging public perception of supersonic passenger jets. Shortly after that, the September 11th terrorist attacks created an understandable sense of public paranoia. Concorde's maintenance expenses had already been rising for years while the number of consumers ready to pay expensive ticket rates had been declining. By 2003, Concorde manufacturer Airbus identified a litany of mounting difficulties, estimating that it would cost British Airways alone £40 million to maintain its ailing fleet over the following several years. After that, they decided to just give up. During its entire existence, Concorde shone through and through as a marvel of aeronautical engineering, and nothing could top it. That's also leaving aside its magnificent looks. The Concorde is now a museum piece, but the ambition of flying faster than the speed of sound in luxury has not perished. A variety of players ranging from NASA and Lockheed Martin to upstarts like Boom Supersonic are vying to resurrect and commercialize supersonic passenger jets. An inviolable legacy was left behind by the Concorde and whoever is going to carry it forwards will have really large shoes to fill. YouTube is now recommending some of our other videos to watch. Before you head on to them though, be sure to leave your thoughts about the Concorde. We'll try to respond to as many of you as possible.